Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be going through a machine learning tutorial in Python. Today we're doing feature selection. So previously we've been going through a general introduction to machine learning, the difference between supervised and unsupervised, which we did in an example using k-nearest neighbors, both clustering and classification examples. However, today we're going to be trying to improve upon our previous k-nearest neighbors regression using feature selection. If you are new here, my name is Kira and I'm a computer science slash machine learning PhD student in first year and my channel here on YouTube is all about academic lifestyle mostly and productivity but I also like to do these videos about my own research and what I've been learning in terms of computer science so that I can help many of you out as well. So I do hope that you will stick around and subscribe to see more content like this and I really hope that you enjoy this video. Obviously today we're going through feature selection and I'm just going to run you very briefly through what we did last week, well a couple weeks ago. What I'm going to show you today can be done with any learning algorithm really but last time we were looking at k nearest neighbours because we've been talking about the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning so we went through KNNs for both of those tasks um, for classification and clustering. And then also I've been talking a bit about case-based reasoning because that's what I use mostly in my research. So I'll have all of these videos linked down below for things that we've previously done. So basically last time, one of the things we did was a K-nearest neighbors regression on the Boston housing data, which is one of the kind of toy data sets that are, is often used for different regression tasks. So that's where we got to last time. And then today we want to look more so at the different features that we have, so the different variables, and using some sort of feature selection methods to reduce the number of features that we have. So very briefly, what the purpose is of feature selection is mainly the reason is that there are lots of learning algorithms that tend to perform very poorly on high dimensional data. What we mean by that is data that has a ton of different features, so a ton of different explanatory variables. There are some learning algorithms that just perform very badly on this kind of data. So this is known as the curse of dimensionality. But additionally, there are other reasons that we might want to reduce the number of features. So that might include reducing the computational cost. So obviously trying to do learning algorithms over a ton of different features is going to take much longer than if you have a few features. There also could be a cost redu reduction to do with collecting the data. So in cases where it's either very time consuming or actually expensive to collect data, having to collect a ton, a ton of data for a ton of different features would be a lot more difficult than just a few features. And lastly, reducing the number of features can often inter improve the interpret <laughs> improve the interpretability interpretability of the model. So obviously having just a few features it makes much more sense that you know, why is explained by a couple of different features than a very long list of features. It just makes a lot more sense to people. So that's generally preferred is to have less features. So then I'm just going to briefly go through the Boston housing data set, which we didn't really go into much detail on the actual variables last week. So we have MEDV, MEDV is the median value of owner occupied homes in thousands of dollars. So the variables will be the answer might be like 23, but what it means is $23,000. And this data set was collected, I think, in the 1980s. So that's the, our dependent variable. And then we have our independent variables or our explanatory variables. We've got the crime rate. We've got the proportion of residential lands zoned for lots over 25,000 square feet. We've got the proportion of non-retail business acres per town. Charles River dummy variable, so one if the tract bounds the river, otherwise it's zero. But the nitric, os nitric oxide concentration, the average number of rooms per dwelling, the age of the owner-occupied units built prior to 1940, so the proportion of ones that were built before 1940. This is the weighted distance to five Boston employment centres, the Radius is the index, the radial variable is the index of accessibility to radial highways. Tax is the full value property tax rate per $10,000. And PT ratio is the pupil t-shirt ratio by town. 
B has something to do with the proportion of black residents by town, which I'm not sure why that's reflective of housing price, but perhaps that would have been more so the case in the 1980s in Boston. But I'm guessing it's definitely not today. And then LSTAT, which is the lower status of the population, the kind of proportion there. So let's close that. Um, yeah, so those are all of the variables. And one thing that I didn't realize last time when I was doing everything was that this variable here, because it's an index, it's not actually, the values are one, two, three, four, up to eight, and then 24, but it's an index. So actually it's more like a label than an actual um, numerical variable. So it's important that a variable like this is actually coded as a categorical variable because it is very different to how it would be if it wasn't categorical. You know, having an actual numeric variable and a categorical variable are very different in how they are portrayed. So it's important to make sure that you incorporate that. So I'm just going to show you now. I'm loading in the data set and getting everything ready. And then you can see here I have this line here, Boston equals as type category. So that's going to code it as a categorical variable. So we've got our dummy variables and that's what's going to happen here. So this is adding in all of the dummy variables, basically these three lines here. Actually, I don't even think we need this one because the next two lines do that. So we've got our dummy variables being gotten by the Boston data. So let's just see if that works. Yeah. And then you can see here, we've got all of our dummy variables. So instead of having the radial variable here, we've got one, two, three, up to eight, and then 24. And then we've got one, like all of these here. So that's what's going on here, is that we need to have that this way. Otherwise, it doesn't actually make sense the way that it's being coded. So anyways, this is kind of what we have done last time. So obviously, the values here are going to be different to the ones we got last time, because I hadn't coded it as... um a categorical variable but apart from that it should be the same everything else will be the same so you can see we've, we're working with a pretty high root mean squared error so this is essentially saying that average the amount we're off by is six and a half thousand dollars which is a lot considering the highest amount for a house in the data set was fifty thousand dollars um and then so the or squared is 0 0.5 and we'd like it to be closer to one so today we're going to be doing different things to try and get that up to one. So firstly, the thing we can do is to filter the features by variation or by variability. So looking here at the variation or variability for all of the different variables, what we would like to see is that there might be some that have a very low variance. Um, I think that's variation why did I say that by variance okay um that they have a very low variance so what's meant by that is that they don't really change much in their values so pretty much then if they have a low variance so close to zero it means that their values are pretty much always the same so it's unlikely that they're good predictors because unless all of the output variables are the same, then it doesn't really kind of represent the changes. Whereas ones that have a higher variance can often be, like that can often be explaining what's going on in the data. So one thing we might want to do is get rid of these two variables and see does that make a difference. But often it doesn't really like, to be honest, it's not really the best thing to do. But you can see here all of these have quite low variance as well, except for 24. So that might be one that's actually relevant, but all of these other radial variables don't really have anything. Um, so one thing we can do is drop those and we can see that has, in, um, that has actually improved us a little bit. Let's just see, can we drop all of these other ones as well? I suppose I think we'll set the limit at 0 0.1. So, the problem is with a rate with a categorical variable like this, you can't just go around deleting loads of them. So another thing that you might want to do instead is actually combine these levels. So have let's say levels one to four, five to eight, and then twenty four on its own, so that there is more of an explanation there. 
but you can't actually just delete some levels and not others because that just doesn't really make sense. Um, I think oftentimes with machine learning especially, if you don't have a good understanding of general statistical practice, people do this kind of thing and it just doesn't really make sense and it's not really the right thing to do. So that's something we're not going to do. We're going to leave those in. So we do, we've just dropped these two and it did give us a little bit of, a, of an improvement. The next thing that we're going to do is um, actually look at the correlation between the features and the expandatory feature. So fright, uh, by the dependent variable, so price. So here we're importing Seaborn and matplotlib. That's just to give us some plots that can actually explain things a bit better. So here we're doing a plot for the correlation and it's going to show up as a heat map. So you can see this is quite a lot to take in. So you can see all of these ones are our categorical variable here. Um, and that's why it's very blurry because there is a lot of overlap in some sense between these. These are all very... Um, like they have very low correlation with a lot of the variables and with each other. So that's kind of what's going on here. Basically what we want to look out for is anything that's a black or a light color. So that can be an indication that we have high correlation between our explanatory variables, which we don't want. So one of the assumptions for regression, if you don't know, for doing any form of regression is that there is no correlation between not no but very not too much correlation between the explanatory variables so generally we would see a value of 0 0.8 and above to be high cor correlation between the explanatory variables so that's something we want to avoid and then similarly we'd like to have the features in the data set that we're going to use to have a high correlation with our medium value for price so First of all, let's just look at the correlations again. So this is all of the correlations with the price. And um, this is just the absolute value. So some are obviously positive and negative here. But here we're just looking at the ones that are, um, we're just doing the absolute value. So they're all positive. So one way that you could filter out the features, I haven't really mentioned much, but a way to get rid of features that doesn't involve your classifier really at all is known as filtering. So when you actually select features without using a specific classifier, instead you just select features and then it means that the features you selected can be used with any classifier. So this is kind of what we're doing here with removing ones that have low variance and also keeping ones that have high, very high correlation here. So here you can see I've decided to keep everything that has a high correlation, so above 0 0.5. Um, so that's what I'm doing here. So here we just have three ones that are actually above 0 0.5. And here I just decided to go ahead and try this for all of the different, um, all of the different variables essentially just trying to get rid of things that are either have correlation below 0 0.1 this is getting rid of below 0 0.2 below 0 0.3 and so on so this is trying out different versions so here obviously this is not really correct because we wouldn't really just get rid of some of the radial variables and um, you can see we didn't really improve there here we have slight improvements this is starting to get up there so this is actually a pretty good improvement even just by keeping this 24 here. So that might give us the idea that we might want to combine levels one to eight, let's say, and then have 24 on its own and then keep them both in there. But then as we go along, the best value that we end up getting is a root mean squared error of 4.73 is the lowest we go with the or squared of 0 0.74. So that's pretty good of an improvement considering it was or squared 0 0.5 and now with just three variables we've gone down to 0 0.74 so that's pretty good um so that's the best we've done so far so you can see that's done i suppose in a way without using a classifier this method could have been easily implemented just as as easily with something else but now we're going to look at an option to that actually decides to keep variables based on their performance in a given classifier. So for here, we were just ranking them by 
correlation essentially and knocking out the ones that were not as highly correlated with the price variable but that doesn't always necessarily give you the same results as if you were to use something else because sometimes the, there are features that interact with each other in some way even if they don't necessarily have high correlation they interact with the classifier so different features can be differently suited to a classifier and can give better results with that classifier than it does with others. So the selection technique we're going to use is using a wrapper. So what that means is that it actually takes into account the classifier and those the method for selecting the features works directly on the classifier. So I'm just taking in the data set again because we have obviously removed some variables and everything. So here we have just getting the the um data set in again. So what we're going to do is known as sequential feature selection. So the different options would be to, one option would be firstly to test out every possible subset of features and see which one performs the best with the classifier. But obviously one issue with that is that if you test out every single classifier or every single subset of features, that would take a really long time if you've got a hundred features, let's say. So the way that sequential feature selection works is that either you can choose to go forwards or backwards or kind of forward and backwards along the way. But essentially, let's say we're going to go forwards here. Um, essentially, what it does is it at each step of the way. So let's say forward feature selection, we start with a completely empty subset and then we make a classifier with each individual feature like a single feature classifier so let's say you've got 20 very or like let's say for this case we've got all of these features and we make a classification model with just each of these variables so we've got whatever 20 something variables or 15 maybe variables that we then make a model just with those so an individual model for each of those. And then we see which one has the best um, performance. And then that one, that feature is selected. And then it moves on to the next step and it then makes lots of two dimensional models. So testing each other feature, adding into this best model that we have so far, it then makes a ton of different two variable models and then sees which one performs the best. And then at the next step, we add in a third variable, but we test at each step which variable is the best one to add at the mod add to the model. So that's how forward um, selection works. And then backward selection is the opposite. So we start with a model that has all of the features, and then at each step, we remove one variable. And we just decide which variable to remove based on the amount that they affect the model. So if the um, the performance may go down a little bit because R squared generally does continue to rise or fall with depending on how many variables there are, even if that variable doesn't actually contribute much to the model. So anyways, those are the two main ways that it works. So that's something we're going to do now. We're going to use the feature selection. So this you can get from selection, and it's called the sequential feature selector in Python. So that's what we're going to do now. Here we're going to set the limit of features to 13. So that's how many variables we have, I guess. And we're going to use the negative mean squared error as our measure for what is the performance of the model. But there are a few, lots of different scoring you could use. That's just what we decided to do. Here we have forward equals true. So we're doing forward step selection. The other option would be to do backwards. So Let's do that and it usually takes a little bit of time to run because it's testing out all of the different subsets at each time. Okay, so going through this now, we can see that here we start off with just one feature. So our best one is LSTAT, it seems, which makes sense from our correlation. Um, and then the next one is number of rooms and then crime and then PT, parent-teacher ratio. So this is the lowest value we get is just about minus 20 and then it starts to increase again. So that means after that we have a 
worst performing model. So let's just change this to false and see do we get the same because sometimes with backwards um, feature selection we actually end up with a different one. So here we have crime. So you can see already that's different. Oh no, it's the opposite of what we want. So we want to start down here. What are we doing? Okay, so we want to see, can we find our best subset now? Okay, so again, we have L stat. Now it's the opposite way around here. Again, we have L stat as our top one, number of rooms, crime, and then PT ratio. So it is actually the same and we've got the same value here. But it just depends because sometimes you just don't really know going up and down. I'm sure there's, there will be some of these subsets that are actually different than the other way around. But anyway, so we've essentially chosen our top four values. So let's then build a model with those and see what we get. So you can see we've improved our root mean squared error and the OR squared by a lot so far. So it is pretty good. And just to double check, we want to see what the correlation is like. Um, do we have any high correlations between our explanatory variables? The only one that is a bit risky is the L stat and root number of rooms. So one thing that we can do is add in an interaction term which could make sense I think because this is the only one that's above 0 0.5 so it's the only one that's relatively significant apart from obviously these ones um but let's just do that and see does that help so we want to add in here we're adding in an interaction term so what it is is we're multiplying together the two columns and adding that as a new column to our Boston data set so now let's run this again. We're going to add in, actually, let's just copy this so that we can have it separately. Okay. So now we're adding in our new variable. And you can see that has improved everything a little bit, not a huge amount, but it has made a difference. So that's one of those things. So our OR squared improved only a very small amount that we might kind of wonder, mm, was that really worth it? I'm not sure. In OR, you can do something called the adjusted OR squared, which basically kind of, um, it will penalize the OR squared score by the number of variables. So I think in this case, we probably wouldn't want to keep that because it doesn't really affect it enough to consider it because it just doesn't make enough of a difference and it probably is just a very small improvement because of the addition of a new feature. So I think we're pretty happy with this model so far. Another thing that we can do now is start to look at the actual um, relationships of the variables themselves, which to be honest is something you should do more so in the beginning, like straight away. But when you've got a, fe when you've got a data set that's got hundreds and hundreds of features, you don't really have necessarily have the time to be looking at all of the data. So not that I'm recommending not doing that step. I do feel like it's a bit easier now to look at these and see the relationships between the variables. So particularly, obviously, we want to look between the price and all the other variables. What is the relationships? So one thing we can notice is that there is these values up the top, which have the max price for housing. And these seem to be outliers in some way because of the fact that they are um, all bunched together, but like across different things, they don't really follow the pattern. And I think the reason for this is that the housing price was actually capped at 50. So it's kind of been, it, they should be somewhere maybe up here as these outliers. I think these houses are probably worth a lot more money. So it just really depends with... Um, it really depends with these kinds of data sets what you want to do because it is possible that there are outliers and it's always difficult to know when you should remove outliers or not. But for the sake of this, let's just say we are removing it. Let's see what happens. So 
We've got Boston da Housing Data Set. Let's... Same. Okay, let's drop those values. And... Yeah, we don't need this. This is just so we can see those. Once we've done that, it does actually increase our R squared by a good bit. So that means we're much closer to 0 0.8 now. And even if we add in, again, our previous one that I was talking about. So we have R M star L stat. Let's just see, does that make a difference? So now our R squared is more like 0 0.801, which is pretty decent for this data set, I think. Lots of linear regression models typically get somewhere around 0 0.66. So to get up to 0 0.8, I think is quite an achievement. Um, other things we could try out at this stage would be to look at the relationships between the variables. So here now, once I've removed those 16 points, we can see the difference in the variables themselves. So here, this looks a lot more smooth now, and so does this. But one thing we might see is that there could be a bit of a curve here. Maybe this is a non-linear relationship. But I think for this, I'm pretty happy with how it looks. I'm going to keep in this, though, if you want to see how to incorporate a, um, a non-linear relationship. So even just I'll show you that now as well. So here we have, we've just squared one of our columns to see, can we add in a non-linear term? Again, doesn't really make much of a difference, but that's just an option as well to start looking at things like that. And we don't need this. Okay, so that's it for this tutorial. I really hope that you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Um, let me know if this is something you've seen before or something you've looked into doing before or if it was new for you in Python because I think this is something I know I used to know how to do it quite well in OR but trying to transition to Python it was actually quite difficult to learn how to do it in the sense that especially for K nearest neighbours I wasn't sure how this would work initially but now it's something that I am quite familiar with so Anyways, I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll obviously have this Python notebook linked down below. And if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to give this one a thumbs up and subscribe to see more content. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.